I want to talk about this movie, Darkest Hour. And, you know, I'll tell you, as I was watching it, it was funny. I was just re-watching the uh, Dark Knight trilogy and uh, Christopher Nolan's movies. And I'm watching Gary Oldman, and I keep thinking Commissioner Gordon, thin Commissioner Gordon. Then this movie goes into Dunkirk. Then I'm thinking Christopher Nolan. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, this is really kind of tied to Dark Knight and Christopher Nolan. And then what I loved about this movie is it really got into the Dunkirk. What, what are the chances of two Dunkirk movies coming out in the same year? And I felt like I should pause this movie, go out and watch Dunkirk again, and then come back and watch the rest of it. Well, it's, it's, it was fascinating. It was just the other side of Dunkirk. Right. You it was, know, what was happening in England at the yeah, time. Yeah, the, the politics surrounding <laughs> Dunkirk. I mean, it was really... And the evacuation. And also um, what they were talking about, how they expected no more than 10% of the soldiers to get out alive. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're talking about those those type of losses were like, it was brutal. And also, all this stuff, too, you kind of, I, I knew this about, I, I read a Churchill biography maybe 10 years ago um, that I bought, actually, if you're ever in London, go to the uh, Churchill Museum that's underneath 10 Downing Street, where right. he ran, and it's, it's, they kept it as it was set up during World War II. Oh, cool. And you see the little cot where he would take a 30-minute nap every day, no matter what. That's mm -hmm. how he cleared his head. In between smoking cigars. And drinking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of the things they brought up for sure in this film. They're like, he's a bloody alcoholic, you know? <laughs> um, he always had a drink or a cigar in his always. head. Always. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was so fascinating about this, it really just focused on the 18, the first, like, 18 days he was prime minister. Right. Mm -hmm. It starts with, they're getting rid of the current the Chamberlain prime minister. They have no confidence. They in. have no confidence in, and then how he's brought in all of the politics. Nobody, very few people trusted him. Right. They were maneuvering to try to get him out of there because they thought he was like he was too like a hothead or or had made mistakes in the past. And they all, many people thought this Dunkirk thing was like, what are you doing? Right. Um, and uh. Well, he sacrificed one garrison to help get them out. Yeah. So he made that decision. He's like, these 10,000, tell them to just start firing. And they're like, well, they're not going to make it out. Much, much of them, will, he's like, yeah, because we need to we save. We need to save this 300,000 or whatever was on the beach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to just, these 10,000 guys are done. We're going to write them off. It's just like, it's just those brutal aspects. And they mention a little bit Gallipoli, which is this really brutal battle that happened in World War One mainly with Australian soldiers. There's a great movie of the name called Gallipoli that came out in the 80s. I would highly recommend watching it um, where they had to sacrifice all these Australians to just die in mm -hmm. World War One, And they and Churchill had some involvement. They just sort of allude to it in this film. Yes, they mentioned it a few times. Yeah. Like, is this, well, what about Gallipoli? Yeah, it's another, oh, you're, is this going to be another Gallipoli? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so <clears throat> it was, and America hadn't, <clears throat> you know, there's a great phone conversation with FDR that's just FDR's blowing him off. Pretty much, You yeah. know, like, well, 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 good luck. Well, we've got a non-aggression, you know, agreement and, and all these things in place because, uh, um, you know, America didn't want to get dragged into another world war mm -mm. We, after we were still recovering from World War One. So, you know, at, before Pearl Harbor, it was really seen as you Hitler was really seen as Europe's problem. Yeah. Which is what it's, it's, it's a classic, you know, this is one of those things that we'll never really know probably, but like FDR, you know, that conspiracy theory of he pulled all the high level brass out of Pearl Harbor. Like he knew it was going to happen and didn't send someone to try to stop it because he needed it to happen to get us into the war. Yes. And uh, if you ever go to the uh, Pearl Harbor Museum in Pearl in uh, Honolulu, uh, they go into those theories and what possibly may have happened. The other thing that I found interesting when I was at the museum is they moved the aircraft carriers out on maneuvers right before the attack because those aircraft carriers were critical to victory. They couldn't lose them. Right. But you know the the rest of the the ships they know they they could have replaced. So now uh, this is all speculation and none of it's proven and it's all, all Monday quarterbacking. Yeah, it's and Monday, stuff like yeah, that. yeah. But it, but it's interesting. Like, uh, 
and it goes back to um, the code breaking when we saw the movie. Uh, uh, oh gosh, what was the name of the, the movie that, that came out? Was it last year? Wind Talkers. Not Wind Talkers. No. no. <laughs> it was uh, the movie the, from the nineties. Doctor Strange. <laughs> this is mid two thousands. Oh, sorry. Um, Jesus, the uh, I know we were the all, one we're with all Doctor blanking. Strange, yeah, the one with Benedict yeah, Cumberbatch, yeah, yeah, Benny, yeah Cumbo? Benedict Cum- Benny Cumbo, yeah, yeah, something game, yeah, the yeah. imitation game, imitation game. Imitation. So you know, the theory was that um, they had cracked the code. They knew the uh, attack was coming. They let us know under the table, and then FDR kind of sat on the information and let the attack happen because he needed something to get us into World War II. Right. So, and that's the thing that so with with all of this <clears throat> history and all that's happened and. <clears throat> knowing and then just seeing the dramatized version of it. So Churchill was seen in some circles in in English government as sort of a a, 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 a warmonger or because he was like Hitler's no joke. Right. And they're like, we need to, you know, we need to start peace talks with him. peace talk. He's yeah. willing to do peace talks. Mm-hmm. And he's like, he's not going to do peace talks. Yeah. If we he's going to roll over us, man. What Look was what, his, his famous line is you can't negotiate with a tiger when your head's in its mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Just a great line. Yeah. And going back to the Churchill Museum, they they play um, kind of recreation arguments Mm-hmm. that he had with his cabinet and in this film you see them sitting in this bunker under 10 Downing Street just yelling at each yeah. other because it's like no bullshit mm-hmm. these are high stakes and it's a good job of acting and a good job of directing in terms of it was very it was differing opinions down there in that bunker and everyone's you you, you the, the thing is because they don't it's 1940 so they don't no one has the benefit of hindsight in that part and the history so no I under- one's looking at their cell phones. No one's looking, yeah. <laughs> and and no one knows the depth of Hitler's evil right. at that point. Mm-hmm. So you understand the like, look, man, we can't keep fighting, fighting, fighting. We're already losing all these people. He's starting to bomb the mainland. You know, uh, we we've got these couple hundred thousand guys in Dunkirk. Like we're gonna we're gonna lose our whole army. There's not gonna be any more men left. Right. We gotta we gotta call it quits. Like I see that I saw I was like was they did a really good job of kind of presenting that point of view as it was at the time. Right. Of a valid point of view versus just saying you know, sometimes filmmakers can just sort of you know, they write that guy out like th- th- that person is viewed as like the guy that said Ah, the Beatles will never make it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and this time they didn't I, which which I think in a in a World War II film Mm -hmm. where it's critical every decision and and having read a fair amount of books about world war ii some of it was like they did at the time they didn't know you know so there was just this kind of taking the data and taking and then there was just some kind of gut instinct (laughs) involved in the people in charge right and the people who were again who wanted to go to peace talks they weren't morons they weren't like no idiots they were like highly accomplished they saw the destruction of their country in front of them, and they're like, "This is the only way we can save any of it." Yeah. Again, going back to what you said about World War One, they had already lost. You know, there was guys there that were in their forties or fifties who were World War One vets, right? And they're like, "We already lost however many men from that one. We're going to do this again? No, mm. no way." Um, and yeah, they viewed Hitler as just, "Oh, he's like the Kaiser," right? He's another, yeah, another, and it's like they didn't understand it, and but hit, but uh, Churchill did, right? And so the 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 politicking and it was done really well. I thought it was a good movie. It yeah. really was. It, it it it. I think it deserves its nominations. I think Gary Oldman deserves his nomination. Now, um, I didn't see these other portrayals of Churchill with Albert Finney, like uh, you said, there was one on HBO. So I didn't have anything to compare it to. I just felt like. Uh, um, he did a really nice portrayal. In fact, Gary Oldman even said he studied Churchill closely to get the performance right, and he also wanted to make sure he uh, was doing more of a creation than an impersonation and tried not to be influenced by the other screen versions, uh, specifically Albert Finney and Robert Hardy. So he he made a conscious effort to try to make it his own. And it's not an easy um, person to play because, first of all, there's a speech 
thing, let alone all the makeup and prosthetics and the stuff he has to go through. But also, you know, Churchill mumbled. Yeah. You know, you can't you can't always understand him. They even make a point of that in the movie. I'm like, I I, I couldn't understand you. <laughs> well, the first it was such a cool thing, and also too that's uh, that Gary Oldman had to like get detox because he smoked 400 cigars. Right. He said mm-hmm. in an interview that the cigar he got budget got nicotine was, poisoning. Yeah, he got nicotine poisoning. He said the cigar budget was thirty grand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but that's the thing too is is in the beginning, you know, Churchill became prime minister like in his sixties or something, mm. you know, and that was really keen how they did his new after how many years of drinking and smoking, drinking and smoking, <laughs> and, and uh, of. The the they start the kind of movie with the the woman. Well, they started in in seeing Chamberlain getting ousted right. in Parliament, and then they start with this this woman who's going to be his new secretary. Mm-hmm. And they just they lay it all out. He mumbles. He doesn't don't type too fast or too hard. He gets pissed off. He's you know, and he was like not easy to work for at no, all. No, no, mm-hmm. you know, and um and then but the, so so having seen several of the, the Albert Albert Finney one. Did a did a great job. That one didn't. It focused on the several years leading up to him becoming prime minister. Okay, and so that that one sort of ends with him becoming prime minister, and then it's sort of like, and the rest is history. Kind of, mm-hmm. you know, he he helps he helps. You know what happens after this? Yeah, you know what happens <laughs> after this. So that was a longer version where this was just these eighteen crucial days. It was a it was a real snapshot of a moment in time in Churchill's life. Um, yeah, in fact, they even say that, uh, um, you know, the in the movie End Titles, it, it doesn't even come up that even though he lost the 1945 election, he was reelected as prime minister in 19. He was reelected as prime minister in 1951. Uh, the Labor Party actually won the popular vote, though the Conservative Party won the most seats. Yeah. Um, it's it's there's a great docu uh, book a biography by written by Ian Carr I believe I forget the name but uh, about Churchill that I that I would highly recommend if you really want to get the whole how he came up and everything. Um, there's more to the story than just the movie. The movie takes place on a specific um, uh, time frame, and there's a lot of stuff that happened before and after. If you mm-hmm. really want to check it out. But going back to the Albert Finney one, which is a, it's just a really good. It's a really good. Mm. well-made HBO thing. Uh, so I, I definitely was comparing it to that, but to give Gary Oldman and Albert Finney both credit, you know... Who could you understand more? Yeah. <laughs> Who mumbled less? Uh, they both did a fine interpretation of this iconic historical figure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like playing any of these, MacArthur or, or any, you know, any of these like... Eisenhower, these these big World War II figures were so larger than life as history has depicted them since they had to they were facing the worst possible situation and, and how they dealt with it with these really awful life and death decisions and having mm-hmm. to make those like, well, we're going to have to sacrifice this many people to save this many more. Right. Um, but no, Gary Oldman, I, I thought. Um, you didn't even recognize him. I mean, it's also a credit to the. Uh, um, the prosthetics department. I mean, yeah. it really, like, it was seamless. Like, you're looking at, like, well, I gotta, there, there's gotta be, like, a, you know, I, I can see where the latex is. And you couldn't. No. You couldn't. It was, it was really seamless. I mean, Albert Finney is an older man who could, you know, there wasn't as much makeup. And Albert Finney, I'm not to take anything away from him. He does a fan, you know, he's a fine mm-hmm. actor and does a fantastic job. But knowing, like, what Gary Oldman actually looks like. Right. He's a pretty mm-hmm. lean, in shape guy. And, and, uh, you know, that was amazing. I remember I was on a plane where they were shooting Dark Knight Rises uh, coming back from Chicago and him and, and um, Christian Bale were on the flight. Mm-hmm. And I had been upgraded. And so I nice. was I was getting off the plane with them at the same time. And I just said, hey, I, I like your work. And he's like, oh, and it, you forget because I'm used to him as Commissioner Gordon. You know, mm-hmm. he's a British. Oh, thanks, mate. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was an Aussie accent. My accents are horrible. Um but it, but I said so. Oh, that's I I really like your work and 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 you could tell Christian Bale was kind of like uh oh here comes a yeah. Batman nerd. Yeah. But Gary Oldman was really was really uh, personable. And well, Christian Bale's like that on the set when he's shooting him. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yes, so yes. that's that wouldn't surprise me that he would be like that actually out in public <laughs> around fans. But I said where so where'd you guys shoot? He goes oh we were in Chicago and then we were in uh, you know Hong Kong and and wherever else. And he goes. 
He goes, I didn't get to go there. I can't can't afford that on policeman's wages. And he looks over at <laughs> Christian Bale. Christian Bale kind of smirks at him like, like, you know, it, it, I took it as like, he knows show business. He knows he knows Christian Bale's going to get the $10 million contract and he's going to get the $3 million or whatever. Right, you know, like, right. He's <laughs> sort of making that joke to me in front of <laughs> to, in front Christian of Bale. That's Christian great. Bale. But yeah, it was it was um, it was really cool, and I've read and seen in, in multiple versions that the the great thing about Churchill, he was this very powerful gruff man who just was a, a you know his wife he'd be like in the in the Albert Finney one there's times he pissed his wife off and he'd be like knocking on her door going I'm sorry kitten you know or whatever mm -hmm. his like nickname <laughs> was. <laughs> This guy that's yelling at generals right. in his office is like, I'm sorry, <laughs> to his wife, which is sort of endearing. Um, so, but all in all, I thought it was a it was a good movie for sure. And, and w what I found interesting is that it was one of those movies too that it left me wanting to learn more about the story. Like mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen. Okay, well now you know he he delivers his iconic speeches. You know he's prime minister. He's making these life or death decisions for the, you know, with the soldiers' lives. Um, you know how it made me more interested in like, oh, right, now how does how is he fighting World War Two? Like right. what happens after the movie ends? But you know, it, it would be a mini series if you went through everything. Um, Darkest Hour Two, slightly brighter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good. <laughs> Put that in a one sheet area. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's pitch that. Yeah. Send it over to Legendary or somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Tower <Dark's laughs> two slightly brighter. Uh. Shot first. Across the